And uh, well, uh, we'll begin with a word of prayer. <laughs> All right. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful for the opportunity we have to uh, come together as brethren and to uh, think a little bit about these different religions. We pray, Father, that you'll help us to understand them and uh, help us to equip ourselves so that we might have some tools to converse with others about Christ and might have a way to bring people to Christ. Help us to understand things better. More importantly, Father, help us to draw near to you and to your Son, who is the only way and truth and the life. To him be the glory forever and ever. It's in his name we pray. Amen. All right. We're talking about the New Age movement. Uh, how old is the New Age movement? I guess we'll ask that first. Uh, um, don't know. Mark didn't really talk about it. Is, is the New Age movement something that's new? Let's ask that. You don't think so. Um, now, the movement itself is typically associated with, uh, you know, springing up in the 1970s, and, you know, there's a whole bunch of precursors to it uh, that we'll get to. But the book makes a point, and I think this is fundamentally correct, that a lot of the ideas of the New Age movement aren't new at all. Uh, they're just essentially repackaged. Uh, what you have with New Age religion, effectively, is uh, a bunch of Westerners in Europe and America got a hold of a bunch of Eastern religious ideas from Hinduism and Buddhism and other mystic, esoteric things. And they said, oh, this looks fun, this looks cool. So they appropriated all those ideas without really fully understanding them. And the New Age movement was born. And that's what you're dealing with, essentially. Uh, now, here's the problem that we have, is that we call, our book calls it the New Age movement, which... I mean, I guess if you're going to, you got to call it something, you know, if you're going to talk about it shorthand. The problem is people involved in it don't call it the New Age movement. Uh, they don't like to call it, a lot of participants don't like to call it a movement at all because that gives the false impression that they're unified and that there's some kind of homogeneity to it. Uh, and then they don't like to be called a religion either because, you know, religion in their mind evokes ideas about, you know, this institutionalized power structure and you know, that's a no-no if you're a New Ager. And the third thing, they don't all like the word, the phrase New Age either. So almost every expression we use to refer to the New Age movement is tested by some actual aspect of the movement itself. So, are you confused yet? Because, I mean, I am a little bit... Uh, and here, here's the thing. It, it, not everybody who is a New Ager will say, if you ask them, hey, what religion are you? They're not going to say, oh, I'm a New Age movement person. You know, it's common for New Agers to identify as Jewish or Christian or Buddhist or atheist or something else. And I sat down and tried to do the, the research for this. Um, you know, it occurred to me that I actually probably had a conversation with someone who was a New Ager very recently and didn't realize it because she introduced herself to me as a Buddhist. But everything about the conversation, in hindsight, all of her terminology, all of her discussion about the universe and energy and validity of all religions and, you know, this idea of positivity and negativity, all of it really sounds like a lot of New Age nomenclature. So, uh, also, she had the idea that we were on the brink of achieving immortality. That's a very New Agey thing to believe. So, uh, those are, but she called herself a Buddhist. She didn't call herself a New Ager. Got to watch out for that. Not new agers will not frequently identify themselves as I'm a new ager. So how can you tell if somebody's a new age age person? Just read their mind psychically. That's how they would do it. Uh, well, it's a uh, you you think I'm, I'm not kidding? You know, the psychic practices are part of that trend. Uh, I found this quote from uh, James Lewis, uh, who wrote in a. He wrote in a book about studies in the New Age movement. And uh, one thing he said, it was written in the 1990s. For anyone researching the New Age movement, the reflections found in Is New Age Dead raise several important issues. In the first place, because individuals, institutions, and periodicals who formerly referred to themselves as New Age no longer identify themselves as such, studies built around a distinction between New Age and non-New Age become more complex. 
In particular, no one can one can no longer simply ask respondents in a straightforward manner whether they consider themselves part of the new age. One must instead rely on more indirect kinds of questions, such as assent to beliefs in reincarnation, planetary consciousness, holistic healing methods, etc., to determine whether respondents belong to the movement. So in other words, if you want to know if someone's new age, you don't ask, are you new age? You ask them things like, do you believe in reincarnation? Do you believe in alternative medicine or holistic healing methods? Uh, do you believe in using crystals on people? Uh, that kind of thing. Well, uh, we'll get to the crystals in a minute. But it's... Uh, it's and it, So, I mean, it's debatable. Some people think, you know, well, you know, New Agers don't all believe the same thing. There's Because one of the main ideas of New Ageism is that the individual is the authority. And, you know, I have the right to, to determine my own truth, create my own reality... And so, from person to person, everybody's ver- beliefs are going to vary a little bit. It's very eclectic. Yes, Louise. Cor- ah, oh, yes. Well, now, here's the thing. And he, there's a lot of ideas that sprung out of the New Age movement that have been adopted by people who aren't New Agers. And one of them is holistic medicine. Uh, which, again, we'll say more on that when we get to that point. But that is something they bring up quite a bit. I mean, well, there's ideas that creep into church Bible classes sometimes that are very New Agey uh, in their approach. And, you know, holistic medicine, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. You know, I mean, I think some of the methods they espouse are somewhat suspect, like, for instance, crystal, the use of crystals and healing. Um, but, I mean, you know, they'll, they'll frequently talk about the value of herbal teas or uh, music therapy or acupuncture. That's a big one. Uh, yeah. And, I mean, you know, there might be something to that. You know, I, yeah, I think that the distinction between Eastern medicine and Western medicine or between, you know, mainstream medicine and alternative medicine is somewhat of a false dichotomy. You know, there's medicine that has been tested and works consistently and there's medicine that isn't tested and doesn't work consistently. And... You know, it's not unheard of for doctors to prescribe things that we would call alternative medicine. So, I mean, you know, what, what you have, of course, in New Agers is, you know, they, they frequently like to pride themselves on, we're outside of the mainstream. We're outside of mainstream society. We're outside of mainstream religion. Uh, we're not subject to the man, you know, as we might put it. Although, I'm, that's my expression, not theirs. Uh, but that's, that, that's the sort of thing you run into. And even though you've got a bunch of people and they don't all believe the same thing consistently, uh, you know, there is admittedly some kind of subculture and that has a unitary function to it. Uh, oh, one of the scholars uh, who talked about the New Age movement, there, there's a lot, been a lot of scholarly research into the New Age movement by sociologists, and so there's actually quite a bit of stuff written about them. And they're always calling it the New Age movement, the New Age movement, the New Age movement, which has got to drive New Agers nuts. You know, the sociologists refer to them that way. But uh, but this is a kind of a thing that happens. But one such leading individual, a guy named Hanegraaff, says that although um, he says that most New Agers are, quote, surprisingly ignorant about the actual historical roots of their beliefs. Uh, so they believe a lot of stuff, but they don't know where it came from. Um, and, you know, just to kind of then they've seen the list a lot of what they call precursors to New Ageism, uh, different influences over the centuries that have they've drawn on. For instance, um, you know, in 1700s, in the, eight, uh, the 18th century, the 1700s, uh, there was what we call the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment was that period of you know great awakening, scientific reasoning. You know, everything can be discovered by rational investigation and appeals to the scientific method. Uh, And that had a lot of effects, of course. Um, One effect that that had was, you know, we got a bunch of new technology that we didn't have before. Um, One effect that it had was, of course, you know, it had an influence on how people read the Bible, uh, for instance. Um, Although some some of it was bad, some of it was good. Uh, Some people used it to tear the Bible apart with their modernist theories. And some people used it more in the sense of, you know, appealing to, you know, very rationalistic book, chapter, and verse approach. One thing that we owe the Restoration Movement to is this idea of the Enlightenment. But while all society is saying, you know, we should be scientific, there was another 
side of that where people said, no, we shouldn't be scientific. We should keep the superstitions and be even more superstitious. Uh, which is, I wouldn't say it that way, but it's, uh, it's effectively what it is. And so you have the rise of the occult. You have the rise of esoteric ideas. You have these mystics who are constantly coming up with these ideas about how they can, you know, they get prophetic dreams or that they can hypnotize people. Uh, one such individual was a guy named Emanuel Swedenborg, a Christian theologian who believed that he was appointed by God to reform Christianity in a book called The Heavenly Doctrine. He claimed that God had opened his eyes and now he can speak to angels and demons and uh, he'd visit heaven and hell. And also the final judgment happened in 1757, he claimed. So you know, he lived you know, all the way to 1772, but he claimed the judgment happened in 57. So you make of that what you will. Um, another guy is a guy named Franz Mesmer. Uh, and well, Franz Mesmer, whose name we get the English word mesmerize from, actually, because he's the guy that invented hypnosis. He didn't call it hypnosis. He called it animal magnetism. Uh, it was He had this idea that you could make an energetic transference between uh, animate and inanimate objects. And so that was going on in the 1700s as well. Uh, Swedenborg and Mesmer together influenced a movement called spiritualism. Has anybody here ever heard of spiritualism? Hmm? Just doing this. Luis is nodding. So, what, what is spiritualism? You've heard of it. Alright, well, spiritualism is... It, it's this idea that it was a movement, in, in kind of a fad, really, in the 1800s, that... Uh, you know, that basically the spirits of the dead have the ability to communicate with the living. Um, anybody ever watch The Illusionist? Uh, well, yeah. Oh, okay, Jenna's the only one that's seen The Illusionist, so I guess this... But, I mean, it was the idea that, you know, and this would sometimes even catch on in certain churches, this idea that you can contact the dead spirits and you can somehow channel and communicate with them. Uh, you ever hear the quote... You ever hear the quote, you don't have a soul, you are a soul, you have a body? You ever hear that quote? Jen's nodding her head. Mark quotes that sometimes. It's wrongly attributed to C.S. Lewis, but C.S. Lewis never said it. Uh, in fact, it appeared in a spiritualist publication. But it gets repeated in Bible classes. It's weird. Um, yeah, it's a spiritualist publication, you know, that this whole... That the real world is the, the spirit world, and you know the body is just a container, which is, is an old idea itself. Uh, now, spiritualism is not the New Age movement, because spiritualism and the New Age movement are separated for like a hundred years from each other. But they're similar in key ways, I think. Uh, because spiritualism sets a precedent of we're going to reject the established religion of Christianity, we're going to reject the scientific approach to religion, and instead we're going to focus on channeling the spirit beings because they have the answers. You know, the spirit beings, you know, the other world, the metaphysical, that has the answers. Uh, and so that's the sort of thing that goes on. Now, spiritualism has kind of faded off the scene today, but the New Age movement is basically filling that role uh, in new ways, I guess. Um, other things, there was, a group, there was a movement called the New Thought Movement, which believed uh, that... You know, humans could be divine and that all sickness begins in the mind. So you could heal your diseases. Your diseases were all the problem. You weren't thinking correctly and you needed to think better and then you would feel better. Uh, and you would actually not be sick anymore. Uh, it's all in your head, in other words. That was, that was a new, something called the new thought. And uh, then there's a guy named Edgar Casey, or Edgar Casey, I'm probably pronouncing his name wrong. Uh, Ed Casey is sometimes considered to be the founder of the New Age movement. Uh, he was a mystic who claimed to have psychic powers. He would go to sleep and wake up and he would claim to have these dreams uh, with information on things like healing and reincarnation and Atlantis. Uh, you know, Atl I'll get to Atlantis in a minute. Um, <laughs> another key influence on the New Age movement is a famous psychologist named Carl Jung. Anybody ever heard of Carl Jung? Joe's nodding. What do you know about Carl Jung? Yeah. Okay. Hmm? Yeah, he's a psychologist. Okay. Let me put it this way. Has anybody ever taken that personality test where they give you four letters, you know, like, uh, you know, you're introverted or you're extroverted, you're intuitive or you're sensing? Do you ever, anybody here ever take that test? A couple people? Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm classified as an INTJ for what that for whatever it's worth. Carl Jung didn't invent that, but he invented the ideas that contributed to that. Uh, so it's a. But in fact, Carl Jung was the person who really kind of popularized the use of you know when calling people introverts and extroverts as personality traits. Uh, Carl Jung came up with that. But Carl Jung was also a proponent of a lot of ideas that were new agey, and including this idea that we're you know, we're coming up on what is known as the dawning of the age of Aquarius. Yeah, there's, a, there's a famous song about that you know, by the Fifth Dimension. It's catchy, but it's a. Um, they move a little closer to the present. Of course, you can't talk about the New Age movement without talking about the era that spawned that song, the counterculture of the 1960s. And here and now we are aware of... Yeah, you know, we're a little closer. This is within some of our, some of the lifetime, not my lifetime, but uh, some of y'all's lifetime. Where, you know, and when we're talking about the counterculture of the 1960s, we're talking about things like hippies and the use of psychedelic drugs and the sexual revolution and, of course, new kinds of music, you know. But... In other words, the trifecta of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Um, but you know, throughout that, there's talk about a new age coming upon us. This age of Aquarius. Uh, we were living in the age of Pisces, which was lame because we lost touch with our spiritual roots and our, our technology was not as cool. But we're coming up on the age of Aquarius, and that's the new age. Hence the expression, new age movement. And that's where things get really exciting. Um, now, at some point along the line, New Aging stopped being about the age of Aquarius and started being more about how people are just looking for alternatives to the mainstream way of doing things in society. But, of course, like everything that isn't mainstream, it eventually becomes mainstream, uh, which is why a lot of the music that was considered alternative back then is now considered old and... Uh, you know, it's not considered classic rock by now or something like that. You know. Alternative always changing. But if you were a new age, you could say you liked it before it was cool, I guess. I don't know. It's a, um, what do new agers believe? They don't all believe the same thing, but are there some things, are there some trends that we can see that kind of tie them together? Uh, y'all were, I mean, y'all, y'all were in the class Sunday. What it, what would you say are some of the key ideas of being a new ager? Huh? What did you say, Jim? Everybody's opinion is valid. Hmm? I'm okay, you're okay. That's a very postmodern idea. Um, you know, it's kind of this uh, inclusive, universalist approach. Um, if having a conversation uh, with a new ager, uh, you'll finally you'll run into expressions like an ocean of oneness, or uh, an infinite spirit, or one essence, or things like that. Um, they'll also sometimes talk about God. They'll use a lot of weird words to talk about the divine, you know, like mind or consciousness or life force or energy. Which the lady I had an encounter with, she was using the word energy a lot. Uh, yes, Jen. Huh? Well, okay, yeah. You ever watching a TV show? You know, the universe is providing a path for me. The universe has told me this. The universe has done that. That's a very new agey idea. Yeah. Huh? Fate, fate, the universe. Uh, there, uh, new ageism sometimes carries a belief in karma. You know, the idea of karmic retribution. Like I said, they're appropriating a lot of Eastern ideas without fully understanding them. But you know, karma is originally something from Hinduism. But new age, but it's common for new agers to espouse belief in karma because you know you do something bad and then the universe repays you in some way later, or you do something good and the universe repays you on a cosmic scale some way later. That's uh, I mean you know the Bible talks about reaping what you sow, but it's not quite the same thing ultimately. But karmic retribution is uh, you do hear about the lot in new ageism. You gotta be careful. And actually, I think this is something the book is slightly inaccurate about. The coexist bumper sticker is more the product of secularists who don't like any religions, but they want, you know, it's like, okay, you religions just stop fighting and get along. But most people who are coexisters are very secularist, which, check back in two weeks, we'll talk about secular religions and all the 
and things they do. Um, yeah, but it's uh, I could not find an independent verification for where that symbol came from, though, and not I couldn't find any like all the New Age websites and writings I ran into. None of them used that symbol, so I don't know what's up with that. John had his hand up so diligently throughout the class. What is it, John? I didn't catch that. Uh, well, that's a different class. Maybe we'll talk about that in the short talk tonight. I, okay. Now, um, another thing, of course, New Agers is, you know, history is broken into distinct ages. There was a, a, a past age. Every, every mythology has a past golden age where stuff was so much cooler and better. And New Ageism is no exception. Uh, and what will happen, sometimes you'll hear talk about these super advanced societies of the past that had all this cutting edge technology and then they just perished from existence. Uh, so I mean, it's common for New Agers to believe in things like Atlantis, for instance. The lost continent of Atlantis. Where they had, I, I don't know, it's, uh, there, there's a Disney movie about Atlantis. They get to Atlantis and there's robots. So, uh, you know, that's a very New Agey idea, again. Um, or sometimes they'll talk about actual ancient civilizations being way more advanced than the historians will tell you. So, you know, Egypt was way more advanced than historians will tell you. Babylon was way more advanced. The Mayans were way more advanced. You know, who knows, maybe they had contact with space aliens or something. Uh, but those are, those are kinds of things that you'll run into. Then we lost that. That was in an age of the past. We fell into regression, the age of Pisces. And now we're coming into the age of Aquarius where people will be reawakened and we'll retain both our lost technology and our lost spirituality. Um, a common theme of New Ageism you know, is to talk about uh, how you know we once were part of a spirit world, but now we've taken on material form, which, again, you may recognize as something that's borrowed from other types of religions. Uh, but there's a key difference. New Agers tend to see the material world as a meaningful illusion. You know, we should try to use it constructively. Uh, a lot of religions that say that we're really spirits and we're trapped in a physical world, they emphasize trying to get out of it. Like Hinduism, for instance. Hinduism is not about reincarnating yourself in the best possible spot. Hinduism is about getting out of reincarnation, getting off of the go round and attaining to moksha, the spirit realm. But with New Ageism... You know, it's kind of like, you know, this is a good place. We shouldn't try to escape from it. We should just try to, you know, get reincarnated into the best thing. You know, this is a domain for learning and growth before we pass on to the higher plane. Um, they tend to think that reality itself is evolving, you might say. Um, you know, and it's, you know, it's common because they believe in reincarnation. You know, oh, maybe, you know, there was this way in a past life. You know, that, that idea is very new agey. Um, spiritual beings, New Agers believe in a lot of spiritual beings, usually, sometimes, sometimes if they, and of course, again, everything I'm saying has an asterisk next to it. If you find a New Ager that doesn't believe something I say here, you know, to come back and say, well, Wayne, you lied to me, you know, that's not what happened. What happened is you found a New Ager who was an exception to the rule, and there's an exception to every one of these. So just be aware of that. Everything on this list has an exception. Yes, Jen? That's true. That's true. Um, the prolificness of exceptions is much more pronounced here, though. Uh, but there are exceptions in other places, too. In Islam and Hinduism and Buddhism and even in Christianity. You know, a lot of Christians will... You'll, you'll meet a lot of Christians that, you know, they're part of a group that believes one thing and then they believe something different. You know, it's just... Um, you know, I mean, I mean, a lot of brethren in churches of Christ. I mean, how many, how many, how many things might we, in conversation, discover that you know, well, one of us thinks this way and the other one thinks another way on some issue here or there, uh, even. Um, okay, New Agers are commonly will believe in spirit beings and believe that they are very interested in what's going on in our development. So you've got angels, guides, masters, teachers, uh, but the view on angels differs widely from person to person. Um, I say, for instance, I mean, you know, the lady I was conversing with a few weeks ago, she believed that Satan was a real being, and that you know, angels and demons were real, uh, which 
proved useful in the conversation later on when we start talking about the difference between good and evil. Um, now, of course, how do we get to these spirit beings? Well, there's what we call channeling. The practice of channeling. Channeling, not universally practiced among New Agers, but it's common, uh, where you can go into a trance and you can channel information from some spirit being, uh, some spiritual source, you know, whether it be God or an alien or an angel or a historical figure or an elemental. Uh, and there are New Agers who claim to have channeled Jesus. Uh, one such is Helen Schuchman, who wrote a book called A Course in Miracles, uh, where she teaches you how to do all this stuff and how to perform miracles too, which I guess those of you who didn't know you had, there's a book on how to perform miracles that was written in 1976. All you gotta do is go first it and you'll know how. Well, of course, you know, if you channel a message, that message is now authoritative. And if someone else channels a contradictory message, that message is also authoritative. And this is where we get the problem of the individual is the ultimate authority. You know, it's an extremely, it's an extremely libertarian religion, which, as someone who has libertarian-ish political leanings, I guess that's, you know, I mean, you can sort of see that, but they, they're very individualist. They're very much of the persuasion, you know, it's, you know, that you're not the boss of me, this whole governmental system, you know, the man can't tell me what to do. And certainly the book can't tell me what to do either. That's the idea that they would put forth. Uh, so it's very common. You know, I mean, like this, for instance, the Bible, they would consider that, someone would consider this to be the result of channeling, but why is your channeling better than my channeling, you know? My channeling is just as good as yours, so that, you know, that, that vision, that revelation I had last night is just as valid as the book that you're quoting to me, they would say. Uh, so th- those are some things to be aware of as we're getting into that. Um, now, uh, healing and alternative medicine. There are basically two ways to go about this. With New Agers, health is the natural state of the human, and sickness is a disruption of that balance. And what we have here, when, we, when you're sick, that has a physical component, yeah, but it also has a mental component and a spiritual component as well. So, and, you know, that whole Western idea of just curing the physical disease, that's... That's not enough. That's not sufficient. We need to go beyond that. So this is what they call the holistic healing method. Um, and there's two ways they go with that. There's what we call the human potential, where basically they argue that Westerners have been suppressing human potential, but if you achieve an altered state of consciousness, you can achieve your human potential. You know, you only use 10% of your brains, but your brain on drugs can use a lot more or something like that. And altered state usually involves the use of drugs of some kind. Um, it doesn't have to, but it can. And sometimes they talk about shamanic methods, or you know, because shamans are considered to be very advanced spiritual people, so they'll they'll consult a shaman or they'll use shaman methods to try to achieve this altered state in which they learn all this cool stuff that they couldn't learn if they were just having a rational conversation with somebody. Um, that's human potential movement. The other side of it, of course, is holistic health, which. You know, which we mentioned before, uses a wide array of methods, uh, including acupuncture, biofeedback, yoga, kinesiology, uh, homeopathy, meditation, nutritional therapy, psychic healing, herbal medicine, music therapy, chromotherapy, and crystals. Uh, always about the crystals. Now, I mean, you know, again, is there benefit in some of those things? Well, I mean, yeah, and this is the point when we go through this is, you know, not everything they say is necessarily bad. You know, the main problem with New Ageism has to do with their understanding of revelatory authority. Um, I mean, the view of Jesus, even. You know, a lot of them would consider Jesus to be a very advanced spiritual person. Kind of a point of contact between the divine and the human. And so a lot of them will think very positively of Jesus. Which, but, you know, the main problem with the New Agers is, you know, this idea, this radical emphasis on the authority of the self. And that's, I think, where the battleground will really be won or lost in conversation with them. Um, ethics. As this, some of this is in the book. Uh, New Agers tend to reject the idea of a good and an evil dualism. You know, Instead, they, they don't talk about good and evil. They definitely don't talk about sin and guilt. Those are things 
You know, that they talk about negativity and positivity. You know, negative energy, positive energy. Um, and, you know, a negative event might just be there to teach me about something. Um, you know, but we want to keep things positive. And, of course, you know, you Christians who go around talking about sin and guilt, you're being negative. You should be more positive. That's the idea. And so New Agers are, it's very com- very commonly critical of blaming and judging others. No one sees the irony in that, really. It's a critical of blaming and judging others. And, of course, you know, if people actually do bad things, there's always karma to set things straight as well. Also, reincarnation is common. I, some of this is me repeating myself because I'm disorganized. Yes. It usually helps when you look at the person you're talking to. <laughs> what did you say? The world is so big. Yeah, well, I mean, a New Ager would talk about the world being like fundamentally interconnected. You know, everything is holistic. Uh, either, And there's two ways you can go with that. Either everything came from one source, uh, or everything didn't come from one source, but it's all interconnected and interwoven together. Uh, there's a sort of a new agey idea that the human can even be sort of divine. You're God. I'm God. We're all God at the same time. That's not consistent from person to person, but that's there. Uh, you know, and it goes hand in hand with this authority of the self issue. Okay, so that's the the history, the structure, the main ideas. Nutshell, Luis. I have no problem with yoga. I mean, it's, you know, okay, here's the thing. You know, some people take martial arts because that's good for them. You know, there's a religious component that gets into a lot of martial arts classes. But you don't have to do that. I mean, you know, just because you're training your body to do one thing, you're, you know, you have to buy into the spirituality stuff. I know some, I know a couple of people who get involved in martial arts training and then, you know, it's like they'll, they'll, they'll get their black belt or they'll get their, they'll attain whatever the highest level is. And then they'll start trying to, you know, the teacher might start trying to put some of this voodoo, uh, you know, mysticism or religious type stuff in there. And that's to say, okay, I'm leaving this class now. I'm going to go take a different class. Uh, but, I mean, that's common. And yoga is the same way. You know, there's a lot of physical, physiological benefits to yoga uh, that one can get without necessarily adopting the religious component of it. Jen. Right. But, yeah, I mean, you know, there's a lot of us like that. I mean, you know, there's a lot of yoga practitioners who, you know, are completely oblivious to the religious component as well. Uh, I saw a parody video on the internet. What would it be like if Gandhi came to a yoga class? And he comes into the yoga class and starts criticizing these people. It's like, well, you don't understand what this means. You don't have any idea what this symbol is. You're just you're just here for, for kicks, basically, you know. But, I mean, the reality is that, you know, Yoga is a form of exercise, and you know there might be a religious component to it in some circles, but you know nobody says that you had to be involved in that. <laughs> it's like you know what what Paul said: hold fast to that which is good, abstain from every form of evil. You know, anytime you're presented with something, you know there's a good element, there's a bad element. We'll take the good and leave the bad. Um, you know, it's. I mean, you look at New Ageism, and you say, well. Learn something about alternative medicine. I know a guy who went to a doctor who, uh, for some alternative treatments, some alternative therapies and whatnot, and she had some really good ideas for him. And then she started bringing the crystals into it. And he said, okay, that's it, I'm done here. <laughs> uh, you know, so that really happened, that really happened. The crystal thing is not a, it's not made up, it's not a joke. But, you know, that is a thing that people do. Um, <laughs> You know, it's just, I guess, you know, being aware of these things, the most important element is, you know, where, where how do we view God? How do we view uh, our relationship to God? And how do we view Christ? And, you know, if our goal is to bring the people we meet to Christ, you know, then we need to address the issues that are preventing them from getting there. Which, since this is world religions class is really supposed to be about learning how to interact with people who are of different faiths, now, let's ask ourselves some questions. You know, how should we interact with a new ager? Or 
And maybe a good question to ask, what should we not do? Yeah. Jen. Don't make fun of them for the crystals. Like we're doing in this video, right? Well, that is, well, I, I, I mean, we got to take we, we got to take it seriously in terms of you know this is the way things are. Um, I mean, because some of them really will push for the healing power of the crystal. Some of them won't. Some of them will. You know, we need. Um, I think that number one thing, and this is really just kind of something that every it really applies to every world religion that we interact with. It's not our job to tell other people what they believe. You know. We can ask questions, you know, what do you believe about this? We can challenge them, why do you believe this? But, you know, if we try to pigeonhole them, and New Agers really don't like being pigeonholed, I'm guessing, you know, if you try to, I mean, even, again, using the term New Ager is a form of pigeonholing people, but, you know, if we're, if we're pigeonholing someone, and we're saying we're putting them in a box and saying, oh, well, you think this and this and this and this, and then you say that, and the response is, well, I don't think that way, you know, why are you attributing positions to me that I don't hold? I don't like it when people do that to me. And if I want to follow Jesus' mandate, treat other people the way you want them to treat you, my first job should be don't tell other people what they think. Let them tell you. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm not in charge of what they think. I don't have some monopoly. I can't read their minds. They've got to explain it to me. Um, and, you know, listen, ask questions. Uh... You know, and really, I think another thing that we need to do, and this is more broadly applicable to every world religion, is find common ground. Find common ground. And use that common ground to work out some of the inconsistencies. For instance, what is some common ground that we would have with New Agers, based on everything we talked about? Anybody think of anything? Jen? Okay. Alright, so they have a positive-ish view of Jesus. That's good. That's good. What else? What other common ground do we have? I think that's a big one, actually. Because, you know, I'm, and this is my thinking. You know, today, I feel like the biggest obstacle that people have to accepting the resurrection of Jesus is... You know, well, resurrection doesn't happen. That's a miracle, and miracles don't happen. You know, they'll say. So it's all, you know, which is very pervading naturalism. This leftover residue of the uh, scientific enlightenment. And, I mean, and we'll say more about that when I sub for the uh, atheism bit. But, but I feel like it's a big obstacle. Getting people over, if you don't believe that miracles can happen, that's a pretty big hurdle to overcome. New Agers, you don't have to overcome that hurdle. They're already on that page. They're already on the page that there is a such thing as spirit beings, that there's a such thing as the supernatural, that there's a such thing as the metaphysical. Now, the question, this was what was so interesting about the lady I had the, uh, the little conversation with, is I didn't have to convince her that Satan existed. She already believed that Satan existed, which was like, okay, that's that's a starting point. You know, we talk about that. And we talk about, you know, well, what forms can Satan take? How do you know that's not Satan talking to you right now? You know, and those are some questions to arise. But we, what we do is we use common ground, and then we say, but here's what you're missing. It's just like what Paul did. In 17, Paul, on Mars Hill, he... Uh, find common ground then used to find inconsistencies. But, you know, when Paul, he opens the sermon on Mars Hill, and he says, I observe that you are very religious in all respects. He compliments them for that. You are very spiritual. Well, New Agers are kind of religious, or they hate religious. They they hate the word religious. They're very spiritual. And then Paul goes on, he says, I'm going around, I'm looking at the objects of your worship. I saw an altar to an unknown God. Let me tell you about the unknown God. The God that you don't know about. The God that created everything and that is missing in your theology and that God did something that your gods haven't done he furnished proof to all men through the resurrection of the dead he has fixed a day, verse 31 he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead you know, that's I mean that's just a very simple model you don't have to have an insider knowledge of new ageism to make that argument 
You don't really even have to, you know, have a deep knowledge of a lot of different scriptures. You don't have to jump all over to all these different proof texts. You know, so often, and this is maybe something I think that has, maybe we've hindered ourselves a little bit in, is we made pe- interacting with people of other faiths a matter of who can quote the most Bible verses. That's not how you win that. And, I mean, I can quote a lot of Bible verses, but it doesn't convert people. And the reason why is because you have to believe the Bible's inspired before that argument holds any meaning at all, whatsoever. Um, you know, if I go up to an atheist, and I start having the conversation, you know, well, I'm, I believe in, in God. Well, I don't. Oh, well, you know, this verse says you should believe in God. Well, if you're an atheist, are you going to be convinced by that? No. <laughs> Jen. Well, exactly. If somebody comes to me with the Quran in hand and starts reading passages from the Quran to try to make me a Muslim, that's going to work. It's you know, like I don't think there's anything to the Quran, so um, I think it's just a mere book. I don't think it's the Word of God. You know, but there is something we can make a case for, and it's something that really what we can make a case for is we can make a case for the resurrection of Jesus, because you know, every, almost everybody. In, except a few crazy out there people, almost everybody concedes that yes, Jesus was a real person. And from there, it's a matter of, well, what does the historical witness talk, talk about him? And if you concede the existence of the supernatural, it's, I think, hard to escape the claims that are made about the resurrection of the dead. Um, and, I mean, this was the, the interaction that I had, and I keep repealing this one conversation, but the interaction that I had, it was... She never once disputed my claim that Jesus rose from the dead. I tried to bring her to attention and say, I don't think you're really paying attention to the significance of it and what it means. She never once argued with me on whether he was raised. It became more about, well, I mean, the truth is that every time I confronted her with it, she would change the subject to something else because you know, that was a very strange conversation. But the lesson in that, I think, in that sometimes the simplest answer is the best. And sometimes the simplest argument is the best. And in this case, we have a very simple plea. Jesus Christ died for my sins, rose on the third day. And if somebody comes back from the dead, I'd listen to them. Wouldn't you? Kind of be important. And what does Jesus say? Well, what some of the stuff Jesus says exposes problems with being a new ager. For instance, this idea that, you know, good and evil aren't a real thing. That's a problem. I mean, you know, how would you respond to somebody who told you, you know, I don't really believe in good and evil? What would you tell them? Hmm? What do you believe? I said, but I, I, when people tell me they don't believe in good and evil, I like to, I like to, I like to go for shock value. But you know, so you don't think that Hitler and the Holocaust was evil? You know, you don't think that's evil? You know, I mean. Huh? Oh, okay, but why the exception? Why the exception? Isn't the exception an admission that there really is a such thing as good and evil if we press the question hard enough? Right? So, I mean, that's a, that's a valid point to talk about and make. Um, you know, or, I mean, you talk about, you, know, you believe in spirit beings. You know, all these different spirit beings. You believe in positive and negative. What about negative spirit beings? Beings. What about negative energy? What about negative spirits? The lady I was with, she did admit the existence of Satan. I go, well, Satan, you have Satan who actually is evil, but who disguises himself as an angel of light. At one point, she started talking to me about how much she loved the Pope because the Pope, you know, oh, you have to trust him. He's dressed in white. It's bright, shining. And I said, you know, well, Satan transformed into an angel of light. Uh, I actually quoted Second Corinthians 11 to her, but... Um, but you know that point came up, and she didn't have an answer to that, really. So those are, and I mean, what happens is, well, Satan masquerades as positivity. He masquerades as white light. How do you, you can trust positivity? How do you know you can trust good feelings? And here's the other thing: since Jesus is such an advanced spiritual being, and so you're going around claiming all these inclusive things, but Jesus said some of the most exclusive things that have ever been said. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. 
That's not an inclusive universalist statement. That is very much a, you're in or out. You're either with me or against me. And if you're not with me, you're not going to heaven. That's the kind of thing that Jesus said. And Jesus is considered an advanced spiritual being. An advanced spiritual man. You know, so ultimately, what hap- if, you know, if all competing views are valid, what do we say for the view that says all other views are invalid? No, it's a it's a logical contradiction with itself. Now, so there's those are a few things anyway. Um, I don't. We're out of time. I, I think there'd be. I think there's some just good ideas to explore, and uh, you know, even if it's the person you're talking to is not a new ager, I'd recommend you know go for the very simple appeal: the resurrection of Jesus. Um, you know, it's the strong. It's really the strongest argument for faith you can make. And it's just a matter of you know, putting that forth and working out its implications, too. That's the other thing. I hope that this has been beneficial. Uh, any comments or questions before we close? All right. We'll pick up next time. I think I'm supposed to sub Sunday morning with Unitarian Universalism. Uh, it gets a little alliterative there. Uh, we'll talk about Unitarian Universalism on Sunday. Mm.